Section One of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis, Nemo, Ian King, Newgate Novelist, and Algy Pug. Corpse Day by Osbert Sitwell July 19th, 1919 Dusk floated up from the earth beneath, held in the arms of the evening wind. The evening wind that softly creeps along the jasper terraces. To bear with it the old, sad scent of midsummer, of trees and flowers. Whose bell-shaped blossoms shaken torn by the rough fingers of the day ring out their frail and honeyed notes up from the earth there rose sounds of great triumph and rejoicing our lord jesus the son of man smiled and leant over the ramparts of heaven beneath him through the welling clouds of darkness he could see the swarming of mighty crowds. It was in the Christian continent, especially, that the people chanted hymns in peons of joy. But it seemed to our Lord that through the noisy cries of triumph he could still detect the bitter sobbing, the continuous weeping of widows and children, which had haunted him for so long though he saw only the bonfires, the arches of triumph, the processions and the fireworks that soared up through the darkening sky, to fall in showers of flame upon the citadel of heaven. As a rocket burst, there fell from it, screaming in horror, hundreds of men, twisted into the likeness of animals, writhing men without feet without legs without arms without faces the earth cities still rejoiced old fat men lent out to cheer from bone-built palaces gold flowed like blood through the streets crowds became drunk on liquor distilled from corpses. And peering down, the Son of Man looked into the world. He saw that within the churches and the temples his image had been set up. But from time to time, through twenty centuries, the priests had touched up the countenance so as to make war more easy or intimidate the people. Until now, the face had become the face of Moloch, but the people did not notice the change, and Jesus wept. End of section. Section 2 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. English Gothic by Osbert Sitwell. Above the valley floats a fleet of white, small clouds. Like castanets, the corn crakes clack. Down in the street, old ladies air their canine pets. A woman with a veil and flowers grasps a canary in a cage, toils up the hotel steps. The towers of the cathedral mutter rage. With ragged beat and grumbling tone, they warn the people of the place that soon they'll find before his throne their maker with a frowning face. The souls of bishops shut in stone by masons rest in quietude as flies in amber. They atone each buzzing, long, dead platitude. For lichen plants its golden flush now, where the gator should have bent, 
with glossy wings the black crow's brush carved mitres caw and merriment wings blacker than the verger's hat beat on the air these birds must learn their preaching note by pecking at the lips of those who treading fern ascend the steps to heaven's height the willow herb down by the wood flares out to mark the phoenix flight of god apollo's car its hood singes the trees the swans who float wings whiter than the foam of sea up the episcopal smooth moat uncurl their necks to ring for tea at this sign in the plump green close the deans say grace a hair pomade scents faded air but still outside stone bishop scale a stone facade a thousand strong church bound they look across shrill meadows but to find the cricket bat defeats the book matter triumphant over mind wellington said waterloo was won upon the playing fields which thought might comfort clergy who admire the virtues that rank yields but prelates of stone cannot relate an iron duke's strong and silent words the knights in armor rest in state within and grasp their marble swords above where flutter angel wings caught in the organ's rolling loom hang in the air like jugglers rings dim catrefoils of colored gloom tall arches rise to imitate the jaws of jonah's whale up flows the chant thin spinsters sibilate beneath the full-blown gothic rose pillars surge upward break and spray upon the high and fretted roof but children scream outside betray the urging of a cloven hoof tier above tier the bishops stare away away above the hills their faded eyes repel the glare of dying sun till sunset fills each pointed niche in which they stand with glory of earth humanity is spurned by one with upturned hand who warns them all is vanity the swan beneath the sunset arch expands its wings as if to fly a thousand saints upon the march glow in the water and then die a man upon the hill can hear the organ echoes he has found that having lost religious fear are pagan till the rushing sound clearly denotes apollo's car that roars past moat and bridge and tree the young god sighs how far how far before the night shall set him free end of section section three of wheels the fourth cycle this librivox recording is in the public domain nocturne by osbert sitwell the brazen glory of the day is done its trumpet flowers fold in their glowing petals all color fades flows into dusk but soon the silver bird of night flits from its nest of summer woods soars upward into the breathless dim dome of heaven as the silver bird mounts higher the leaves of all the lofty trees are turned to frozen waterfalls cool stalactites that hang above our reach until this rustling wind melts them and coolness drips down upon us then the bell-shaped turrets of the evening flowers flutter and sigh unsheath their sun-bound scent and we are free once more to rest within the shuttered sweetness of the woods end of section
Section four of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Betrothal of Priapus by Aldous Huxley. Dark water, the moonless side of the trees, the dog star sweating in the roses, mind heat curdled to sheer flesh. For ease and the sake of coolness, having dined, I loose a button wrench a stud we belch to the tune of drunk moselle what a noise in the temples hammering blood shall we sit down are we altogether well how weedily the river exhales like the smell of caterpillars dung you too collected when i was young but use no camphor moth prevails over moths you take me Sounding close, but God knows where, two land rails scrape nails on combs. Her hair is loose, one tendril astray upon the nape, of a neck which star revealed is white like an open eye tobacco flower, frail thurible which fills the night with the subtle intoxicating power of summer perfume. And you too. Your scent intoxicates, the smell of clothes, of hair, the essence of you. But for the ferments of Moselle, I'd swoon in the languor of your perfume, in the drowsed, delicious contemplation of an exine palely through the gloom. Another hideous eructation. And I wake, distressingly aware that there are uglier things in life then perfumed stars and women's hair action then action will you be my wife end of section section five of wheels the fourth cycle this librivox recording is in the public domain frascati's by aldous huxley Bubble-breasted swells the dome of this my spiritual home, from whose nave the chandelier, frozen, Schaffhausen, tumbles sheer. We in the round balcony sit, lean o'er, and look into the pit where feed the human bears beneath, champing with their gilded teeth. What negroid holiday makes free with such priapic revelry? What songs, what gongs, what nameless rites what gods like wooden stalagmites what reeking steam of kidney pie what blast of bantu melody ragtime but when the wearied band swoons to a waltz i take her hand and there we sit in blissful calm quietly sweating palm to palm end of section Section six of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Varies by Aldous Huxley. Here, every winter's night at eight, Epicurus lies in state, two candles at his head and two candles at his feet. A few choice spirits watch beneath the vault of his dim chapel where default of music fills the pregnant air with subtler requiem and prayer than ever an organ wrought with notes spouted from its tubal throats black ethiopia's holy child the cradled bottle breathes its mild meek spirit on the ravished nose the palate and the tongue of those who piously partake with me of this funereal agape. End of section. Section 7 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Topiary by Aldous Huxley. Failing sometimes to understand why there are folk whose flesh should seem like carrion 
puffed with noisome steam. Fly blown to the eye that looks on it. Fly blown to the touch of a hand. Why there are men without any legs, whizzing along on little trolleys, with long, long arms like apes? Failing to see why God, the topiarist, should train and carve and twist men's bodies into such fantastic shapes? Yes, failing to see the point of it all, I sometimes wish that I were a fabulous thing in a fool's mind. Or, at the ocean bottom, in a world that is deaf and blind, very remote and happy, a great goggling fish. End of section. Section 8 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Love Song by Aldous Huxley Dear, absurd child, too dear to my cost, I found. God made your soul for pleasure, not for use. It cleaves no way, but angled broad, obtuse, impinges with a slabby-bellied sound full upon life, and on the rind of things rubs its sleek self and utters purr and snore, and all the gamut of satisfied murmurings, content with that, nor wishes anything more. A happy infant, daubed to the eyes and juice of peaches that flush bloody at the core. Naked you bask upon a south sea shore, while o'er your tumbling bosom the hair floats loose. The wild flowers bloom and die, the heavens go round with the song of wheeling planetary rings. You wriggle in the sun, each moment brings its freight for you, in all things pleasures abound. You taste and smile, then this for the next pass over. And there's no future for you, and no past. And when, absurdly, death arrives at last, T'will please you a while to kiss your latest lover. End of section. Section 9 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Complaint of a Poet Monke by Aldous Huxley We judge by appearance merely. If I can't think strangely, I can at least look queerly. So I grew the hair so long on my head that my mother wouldn't know me, till a woman in a nightclub said, as I was passing by, Hello, here comes Salome. I looked in the dirty gilt-edged glass, and, oh, Salome, there I was, positively jeweled, half a vampire, with the soul in my eyes hanging dizzily like the gatherer of proverbial samphire over the brink of the crag of sense. Looking down from perilous eminence into a gulf of windy night, and there's straw in my tempestuous hair, and I'm not a poet, but never despair. I'll madly live the poems I shall never write. End of section. Section 10 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Reef by Aldous Huxley My green aquarium of phantom fish Goggling in on me through the misty panes My rotting leaves in fields spongy with rains My few clear, quiet autumn days I wish I could leave all Clearness and mistiness Sodden or goldenly crystal all too still. Yes, and I too rot with the leaves that fill the hollows in the woods. 
I am grown less than human, listless, aimless as the green idiot fishes of my aquarium, who loiter down their dim tunnels and come and look at me and drift away, not seen or understand, but only glazedly reflected, upwards, upwards, through the shadows through the lush sponginess of deep sea meadows where hair-lipped monsters batten let me ply winged fins bursting this matrix dark to find jewels and movement mintage of sunlight scattered largely by the profuse wind and gulfs of blue brightness too deep for sight free newly born on roads of music and air speeding and singing i shall seek the place where all the shining threads of water race drawn in green ropes and foamy meshes there on the red fretted ramparts of a tower of coral rooted in the depths shall break an endless sequence of joy and speed and power Green shall shatter to foam, flake with white flake shall create an instant's shining constellation upon the blue, and all the air shall be full of a million wings that swift and free laugh in the sun, all power and strong elation. Yes, I shall seek that reef, which is beyond all isles however magically sleeping in tideless seas, uncharted and unconned save by blind eyes, beyond the laughter and weeping that brood like a cloud over the lands of men. Movement, passion of color and pure wings, curving to cut like knives, these are the things I search for. Passion, beyond the ken of our foiled violences, and more swift than any blow which man aims against time. The invulnerable motion that shall rift all dimness with the lightning of a rhyme, or note, or color. And the body shall be quick as the mind, and soul shall find release from bondage to brute things, and joyously soul will and body in the strength of triune peace shall live the perfect grace of power unwasted and love consummate marvelously blending passion and reverence in a single spring of quickening force till now never yet tasted but ever ceaselessly thirsted for shall crown the new life with its ageless starry fire I go to seek that reef far down, far down below the edge of every day's desire, beyond the magical islands where of old I was content, dreaming, to give the lie to misery. They were all strong and bold that thither came, and shall I dare to try? End of section. Section 11 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Serenade from Bird Actors by Sir Cheverell Sitwell. Sigh soft, sigh softly, rain thrilled leaves. Let not your careless hands stem the gold wind. Let not your green sleeves swim in its breath as water flowing lest your thin hands make gurgle down the crystal hills the gaudy sun's pavilions whence he distills the showered scents whose value all true turtles croon beneath their swinging palaces sing low then turtles sigh soft swift wind and fountains cease your flutings malala now lean on your balcony look down my strings shall sing. End of section.
Section 12 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Italian Air by Sir Cheverell Sitwell. In among the apple trees, and on their echoing golden roofs, a singing shower rides on the breeze and prints the grass with crystal hoofs. The sighing music faints and fails among the far off feathered boughs. The birds fold up their painted sails, but voices sound, until they rouse the sleeping birds and silent leaves. And now a harp once more resounds, to utter what her heart believes, and what her trembling sense confounds. The daring loudness wakes the house that sleeps beneath the staring sun. The birds awake, the cattle browse, the page jumps down begins to run across the flower-beds. Now there rings another voice of sterner kind. The harp sounds still. Figaro sings to ease his master's troubled mind. End of section Section 13 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. H. or A Lady from Babel by Sir Cheverell Sitwell Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Parlez-vous Francais? Parlate Italiano? Dearest child. Mrs. H. would float the words as jewels from her sunshade, which, to my infant eyes, seemed as a fountain of all frankincense. Beneath the twittering shadow she leaned out, looking in one's eyes, her body perfectly enmeshed beneath the clinging scales of gold, and all her landau filled with the falling jewels, the melting of the million bells set ringing when the wind breathes, and the blue spaces of the sky are filled with shaking leaves, divine wisdom as a freehold gift from black-gloved hands, the feast of untold tongues. On a bridge one evening, from behind the nearest house, the sunset air came suddenly alive with sound. The throbbing from a mandolin fell forth as the long lines of water when a boat floats by. This ended, she was asked for coppers in Italian. Coachman, drive on! Mes meilleurs sont rimons à maman. Mes meilleurs. End of section. Section 14 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Vals Estudiantina by Sir Cheverell Sitwell. A wall of cactus guards the virgin sound dripping through the sword edged leaves, the wayward milking of your mental stalactites on the strung bells of music, arrests the moment, petrifies the air. As you trudge along the path laid down before you, counting all the trees, remembering the turnings, instead of resting on the wooden seats, you lie among the thistles in the sun. Your poor jangle spreads along the street, filtering the voices of the passer-by, embroidering the singing in the lines of wire, and masking, as with histrionic aim, the bird sound of long-distance messages. Now, with a practised hand, the music master will release the waltz that makes a difference in our lives. With one hand on the railing to feel the rings of sound, one might emphasise the vision. Some are sitting under flame-touched trees, where the generous sun has run the fierce green plumes set quivering on the harp-strings of the boughs, has run them to a fine fire of gold, has quickened them as islands cut the currents of the sea, to the full-spun colour of the floating jewels that part the wind's gold hair, and fill the ultimate sea with all its canopy of clouds and tents of quick blue hills with a new message of their incense cells. Beneath these trees the suffocated crowd extends its troubled surface, till toying with another figured shape the extreme couples lie among the grass. This tune brings evening ringing down on the well-bedecked windows of the day, and, rising on their tired feet, 
running the fingers through their flower-decked hair, they leave the vast arena of the band, moving on the tightrope of the tune. Ring out, ring out now, ring out now, the blare of your hundred brass trumpets. Shake the leaves down, shake the leaves down, make the clouds dance like flowers in the wind. In the darkening room you sit beside the piano, where the music master stretches his shadow. As he moves his hands, in your mind ringing on its meals, the rightful tunes to play are the sweet songs of birds, the yaps of dogs, hot water tapping on the leaden pipes. As a final consummation, father arriving by the evening train. End of section. Section 15 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Three Poems by Arnold James. One. Now the gold goes trickling out of the sunset, leaving blue and the deep slumbering red. Beautiful, calm in accomplishment, but dead. Dark green leaves dance over the deepening sky, and silver starlight dreamingly tranquil. But still as death, now the gold has gone so still. The mystic starlight peeps, and the tides are running, and the little wind sings with musical breath. In all that music, I feel the pulse of death. Now you have left me, maybe but for a day. I think your life, like the sunset gold, sinking down strange dark seas, flows home to the sunrise spring. Now you are gone from me, all is fair and calm. The beautiful trees wave dark against blue dark, but the gold is gone. From the garden shadows hark, a bird of night, showering starry song, surely in praise of death. Away tis born, away, away, to be merged in the songs of morn. 2. Now my white-winged dreams do rove, like silver ocean doves, that soar in circling flights and falls above a wave-lapped shore. Pale turquoise hues o'erspread the skies, white clouds voyaging overhead, and marmoreal serenities are portraited. Tall ships majestically glide, with scarce a stirring of sea spray, nor scarce a breath to swell their pride of sail array. And yet those jeweled deeps do hold, far beyond sight or any sound, pale gleaming relics of the drowned. Ribs that of old throbbed to the tune of hopes and fears, and danced with the desire of fame. Cheeks that have felt the kiss of tears, the lash of shame. From the dim bosom of the seas, their wide and solemn resting place, floats sometimes to the still surface, pale dust of these. And wistfully the sun looks down on that he once beheld so fair, and seaweed tangles on the air, carelessly thrown. My dreams do silver wings outspread, nor wing their course less joyously, though scattered on the calm may be, dust of the dead. 3. My lips were blossoming flowers of bitterness, my strained, heart-strings, sly-fingered despair, plucked sinisterly to a low, swift air of gypsy laughter. In a night starless, my soul fled blindly through the wilderness, till clouds being rent, the moon with leer and flare, let dangle through the cracks her silvery hair, a shining harlot, drunk with loneliness. And all the while, a still and secret place of pools and greenery and swinging flowers, 
distilled a perfumed peace for one within. His countenance the characters of sin score not, nor feverish mirth leaves any trace, nor tears, upon his calm and violet hours. End of section. Section 16 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Cordova by Francisco Quevedo. Translated from the Spanish of Quevedo by Alvaro de Guevara. Great squares are here and streets narrow. A rich bishop and merchants and poor. Houses without wastes, men to waste, rooms hung over with pins, a pale Bacchus, a bony Venus, with many a Judas and Peter, a few cocks, pins and needles running to boredom, a bridge that there is none to repair, a Saint Paul amongst many Saint Benedicts, a foolish mob, a discreet gangara. This found I in Cordova. Who would find more may continue this poem. End of section. Section 17 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To the Mosquito of the Little Trumpet by Francisco Quevedo Translated from the Spanish of Quevedo by Alvaro de Guevara Minstrel of the ration stings Postilion mosquito, barber fly You have made my pate a sieve And have demolished my face with your onslaught Little trumpet of the blows and buffets you come armed with a lance against my skin. Flee, Cupid, trumpeting bug. You fly with sharp itchings. Why warn me if you wish to sting me? For you give pain to those you sing to. You fly, you sting, and you frighten. And you learn from care in the women to spoil sleep amongst the blankets. End of section. Section 18 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elders by Iris Tree. You preach to me of laws, you tie my limbs with rights and wrongs and arguments of good. You choke my songs and fill my mouth with hymns. You stop my heart and turn it into wood. I serve not God, but make my idol fair from clay of brown earth, painted bright with blood, dressed in sweet flesh and wonder of wild hair by beauty's fingers to her changing mood. The long line of the sea, the straight horizon, the toss of flowers, the prance of milky feet and moonlight clear as glass, my great religion, and sunrise falling on the quiet street. The coloured crowd, the unrestrained, the gay, and lovers in the secret sheets of nights, trembling like instruments of music, till the day stands marvelling at their sleeping bodies white. Age creeps upon your tired little faces beneath each black umbrella, sly and slow. Proud in the unimportance of your places, you sit, in twilight, prophesying woe. So dim and false and grey, take my compassion, I, from my pageant golden as the day, pity your littleness from all my passion. Leave you my sins to weep and whine away. 
End of section. Section 19 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Complex Life by Iris Tree. I know it to be true that those who live as do the grasses and the lilies of the field, receiving joy from heaven, sweetly yield their joy to earth, and taking beauty, give. But we are gathered for the looms of fate that time with ever-turning multiplying wheels spins into complex patterns and conceals his huge invention with forms intricate. Each generation blindly fills the plan, a sorry muddle, or an inspiration of God. With many processes from out the sod, the earth and heaven are mingled and made man. We must be tired and sleepless, gaily sad, frothing like waves in clamorous confusion, a chemistry of subtle interfusion, experiments of genius, that the ignorant call mad. We spell the crimes of our unruly days, we see a fabled Arcady in our mind, we crave perfection that we may not find time laughs within the clock and destiny plays. You peasants and you hermits, simple livers, so picturesquely pure, all unconcerned, while we give up our bodies to be burned and dredge for treasure in the muddy rivers. We drink and die, and sell ourselves for power. We hunt with treacherous steps and stealthy knife, we make a gaudy havoc of our life and live a thousand ages in an hour. Our lives are spoilt by introspective guile. We vivisect our souls with elaborate tools. We dance in couples to the tune of fools and dream of harassed continents the while. Subconscious visions hold us, and we fashion delirious verses, tortured statues, spasms of paint, make cryptic perorations of complaint, inverted religion, and perverted passion. All against all, a vast conspiracy, we blindly stab the hearts that wish us well. We feast ourselves within a gilded hell. Our patriotism is varnished piracy. But since we are children of this age, and must, in curious ways, discover salvation, I will not quit my muddled generation, but ever plead for beauty in this rage. Although I know that nature's bounty yields unto simplicity a beautiful content, only when battle breaks me and my strength is spent, will I give back my body to the fields. End of section. Section 20 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Remorse by Iris Tree What were you doing in the colour, in the dangerous brilliancy, the crowding people died with violent moods? You have tasted poison from the little fluted glasses, and loved your red reflection in the mirror, and heard your songs in whispers round the room and flattery a thousand tangling ribbons catching alluring flung down from the galleries dawn is here and your soul goes running away down the street the road that leads to whiteness and a purity of hope morning 
the remorseful the ghostly the wonder-eyed treading with wistful feet among the rubbish we have heaped and you half broken cast out of night into the gutter flowing with it down the street to the whiteness of the sea end of section Section 21 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Soul's Avarice by Iris Tree. I caught a golden mood in the cobwebs of a gloomy day, and it is dead. In the shelves and cupboards of the soul, the embalmed corpses of many fancies are threaded moths of blind pilgrimage toward a taper's light dragonflies like gaudy dreamers lethargic bumblebees wasps streaked with venom and fear and nonchalant butterflies varied in beautiful vanities o oh, spider zealot with invisible loom and silent shuttle weaving thy intricate snares till some swift glittering moment shall tremble in the meshes thou hast spread emotion's blood to splash the apathy with fire and gorge thy emptiness end of section section twenty two of wheels the fourth cycle this librivox recording is in the public domain wanderlust by iris tree i feel in me a manifold desire from many lands and times and clamouring peoples and i the queen of crowding vagabonds ghosts of lost years in seeming fancy dress with pathos of torn laces and broken swords cut-throats and kings and poets in visions wild not knowing what i was in me no end even where the last content clasps on my head a crown of shining endurance I slip from all my robes into the rags of a tattered romance. The stars crowd at the window, their jealous destiny raps at the door. They bob and wink and leer. And I must leave the lamplight for the road to keep strange company. Farewell and hail. End of section. Section 23 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Changing Mirrors by Iris Tree. I see myself in many different dresses, in many moods, and many different places all gold amid the grey where solemn faces are silence to my mirth a flame that blesses from yellow lamp the darkness which oppresses or amid the dancers in their trivial laces aloof as in the ring a lion paces disdainful of their slander or caresses i see myself the child of many races poisoners martyrs harlots and princesses within my soul a thousand weary traces of pain and joy and passionate excesses eternal beauty that our brief life chases with snatch of desperate hands and dying tresses end of section Section 24 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lamp Posts by Iris Tree. 
the eternal flame of laughter and desire breaks the long darkness with a little glance till all the gloom is radiant in a dance of yellow hopefulness reflecting fire that dreams from heaven's lamps as we aspire sadly toward their jubilance romance of fairy glitter in the streets of chance those beacon trees that blossom from the mire within the fog of our despairing gloom in the glum alleys down the haunted night through tunnelling of subterranean doom among the grovelling shadows kingly bright they bear their coronets of golden bloom to front our anguish with their brave delight end of section Section 25 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory by Iris Tree From far away the lost adventures gleam, The print of childhood's feet that dance and run, The love of her who showed me to the sun In triumph of creation, who did seem with vivid spirit like a rainbow stream to paint the shells young blossoms one by one each strange and delicate toy whose hands have spun the woven cloth of wonder like a dream the row of soldiered books authority sharp as the scales i strummed upon the keys the priest who damned the things i dared not praise rebellion love made sad by mystery and like a firefly through the twilit trees romance the golden playboy of my days End of section. Section 26 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Disenchantment by Iris Tree. Silence. Somewhere on earth there is a purpose that i miss or have forgotten the trees stand bolt upright like roofless pillars of a broken temple there is a purpose in heaven but for me nothing end of section Section 27 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Show by Wilfred Owen, Killed in Action. The Show. My soul looked down from a vague height with death, as unremembering how I rose or why, and saw a sad land, weak with sweats of dearth, grey, Crated like the moon with hollow woe, And fitted with great pox and scabs of plaques. Across its beard, that horror of harsh wire, There moved thin caterpillars, slowly uncoiled. It seemed they pushed themselves to be as plugs of ditches, Where they writhed and shriveled, killed. By them had slimy paths been trailed and scraped, Round myriad warts, that might be little hills. From gloom's last dregs, these long-strung creatures crept and vanished out of dawn, down hidden holes, and smell came up from those foul openings, as out of mouths or deep wounds deepening. On dithering feet upgathered more and more, brown strings towards strings of grey with bristling spines, all migrants from green fields, intent on mire. Those that were grey, 
of more abundant spawns, ramped on the rest, and ate them, and were eaten. I saw their bitten backs curve, loop, and straighten. I watched those agonies curl, lift, and flatten. Whereat, in terror, what that sight might mean, I reeled and shivered earthward like a feather, and death fell with me like a deepening moan. And he, picking a manner of worm, which half had hid its bruises in the earth, but crawled no further, showed me its feet, the feet of many men, and the fresh severed head of it, my head. End of section. Section 28 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Meeting by Wilfred Owen. Strange Meeting. It seemed that out of the battle I escaped, down some profound dull tunnel, long since scooped through granites, which titanic wars had groined. Yet also there, encumbered sleepers groaned, too fast in thought, or death, to be bestirred. Then, as I probed them, one sprang up, and stared with piteous recognition in fixed eyes, lifting distressful hands, as if to bless. And by his smile, I knew that sullen hall. With a thousand fears, that vision's face was grained. Yet no blood reached there from the upper ground, and no guns thumped, or down the flues made moan. Strange, friend, I said, here is no cause to mourn. None, said the other, save the undone years, the hopelessness. Whatever hope is yours, was my life also. I went hunting wild after the wildest beauty in the world, which lies not calm in eyes or braided hair but mocks the steady running of the hour, and if it grieves, grieves richlier than here. For by my glee might many men have laughed, and of my weeping something has been left, which must die now. I mean the truth untold, the pity of war, the pity war distilled. Now men will go content with what we spoiled, or discontent, boil bloody, and be spilled. They will be swift, with swiftness of the tigress. None will break ranks, though nations trek from progress. Courage was mine, and I had mystery. Wisdom was mine, and I had mastery. To miss the march of this retreating world into vain citadels that are not walled. Then, when much blood had clogged their chariot wheels, I would go up and wash them from sweet wells, even with truths that lie too deep for taint. I would have poured my spirit without stint, but not through wounds, not on the cess of war. Foreheads of men have bled where no wounds were. I am the enemy you killed, my friend. I knew you in this dark. For so you frowned yesterday through me, as you jabbed and killed. I parried, but my hands were loath and cold. Let us sleep now. Editor's note. This poem was found among the author's papers. It ends on this strange note. End of section. Section 29 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Terre by Wilfred Owen. A Terre, being the philosophy of many soldiers. Sit on the bed. I'm blind and three parts shell. Be careful. Can't shake hands now. Never shall. Both arms have mutinied against me. Brutes. My fingers fidget like ten idle brats. I try to peg out soldierly. No use. 
one dies of war like any old disease. This bandage feels like pennies on my eyes. I have my medals, discs to make eyes close, my glorious ribbons ripped from my own back in scarlet shreds. That's for your poetry book. A short life and a merry one, my brick. We used to say we'd hate to live dead old, yet now I'd willingly be puffy, bald and patriotic. Buffers catch from boys, at least the jokes hurled at them. I suppose little I'd ever teach a son but hitting, shooting, war, hunting, all the arts of hurting. Well, that's what I learnt. That and making money. Your fifty years ahead seem none too many. Tell me how long I've got. God, for one year to help myself to nothing more than air, one spring, is one too good to spare, too long. Spring wind would work its own way to my lung and grow me legs as quick as lilac shoots. My servant's lamed, but listen how he shouts. When I'm lugged out, it'll still be good for that. Here in this mummy case, you know, I've thought how well I might have swept his floors forever. I'd ask no night off when the bustle's over, enjoying so the dirt. Who's prejudiced against a grimed hand when his own's quite dust? Less live than specks that in the sun shafts turn. Less warm than dust that mixes with arms tan. I'd love to be a sweep now, black as town, yes, or a muck man. Must I be his load? Oh, life, life, let me breathe. A dugout rat, not worse than ours, the existence is rat's lead. Nosing along at night, down some safe vat, they find a shell-proof home before they rot. Dead men may envy living mites in cheese, or good germs even. Microbes have their joys, and subdivide, and never come to death. Certainly flowers have the easiest time on earth. I shall be one with nature, herb and stone, Shelley would tell me. Shelley would be stunned. The dullest Tommy hugs that fancy now. Pushing up daisies is their creed, you know. To grain, then, go my fat, to buds my sap, for all the usefulness there is in soap. Do you think the Bosch will ever stew man soup? Some day, no doubt, if. Friend, be very sure I shall be better off with plants that share more peaceably the meadow and the shower. Soft rains will touch me, as they could touch once, and nothing but the sun shall make me wear. Your guns may crash around me, I'll not hear, or if I wince, I shall not know I wince. Don't take my soul's poor comfort for your jest. Soldiers may grow a soul when turned to fronds, but here the things best left at home with friends. My soul's a little grief grappling your chest, to climb your throat on sobs, easily chased on other sighs, and wiped by fresher winds. Carry my crying spirit till it's weaned, to do without what blood remained these wounds. End of section. Section 30 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Century by Wilfred Owen. The Century. We'd found an old Bosch dog out, and he knew, and he gave us hell for shell on frantic shell, hammered on top, but never quite burst through. Rain guttering down in waterfalls of slime kept slush waist-high, that rising hour by hour, choked up the steps too thick with clay to climb. What murk of air remained, stank old and sour, 
with fumes of whizbangs and the smell of men who'd lived their years and left their curse in the den, if not their corpses. There we herded from the blast of whizbangs, but one found our door at last, buffeting eyes and breath, snuffing the candles, and thud, flump, thud, down the steep steps came thumping and splashing in the flood, deluging muck, the sentry's body, then his rifle, handles of old Bosch bombs, and mud in ruck on ruck, we dredged him up, for killed, until he whined. Oh, sir, my eyes, I'm blind, I'm blind, I'm blind. Coaxing, I held a flame against his lids, and said if he could see the least blurred light, he was not blind, in time he'd get all right. I can't, he sobbed. Eyeballs huge bulged like squids, watch my dreams still. But I forgot him there, in posting next for duty, and sending a scout to beg a stretcher somewhere, and floundering about to other posts under the shrieking air. Those other wretches, how they bled and spewed, and one who would have drowned himself for good. I try not to remember these things now. Let dread hark back for one word only, how half listening to that sentry's moans and jumps, and the wild chattering of his broken teeth, renewed most horribly whenever crumps pummeled the roof and slogged the air beneath. Through the dense din, I say, we heard him shout, I see your lights, but ours had long died out. End of section. Section 31 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Disabled by Wilfred Owen. Disabled. He sat in a wheeled chair, waiting for dark, and shivered in his ghastly suit of grey, legless, sewn short at elbow. Through the park, voices of boys rang saddening like a hymn, voices of play and pleasure after day, till gathering sleep had mothered them from him. About this time, town used to swing so gay when glow lamps budded in the light blue trees, and girls glanced lovelier as the air grew dim. In the old times, before he threw away his knees. Now he will never feel again how slim girls' waists are, or how warm their subtle hands. All of them touch him like some queer disease. There was an artist silly for his face, for it was younger than his youth last year. Now he is old, his back will never brace, he's lost his colour very far from here poured it down shell holes till the veins ran dry, and half his lifetime lapsed in the hot race, and leap of purple spurted from his thigh. One time he liked a blood smear down his leg, after the matches carried shoulder high. It was after football, when he'd drunk a peg, he thought he'd better join, he wonders why. Someone had said he'd look a god in kilts. That's why, and maybe, too, to please his Meg. Aye, that was it. To please, to giddy jilts, he asked to join. He didn't have to beg. Smiling, they wrote his lie, aged nineteen years. Germans he scarcely thought of, all their guilt, and Austria's, did not move him, and no fears of fear came yet. He thought of jewelled hilts for daggers in plaid socks, of smart salutes, and care of arms, and leave and pay arrears, esprit de corps, and hints for young recruits. And soon he was drafted out with drums and cheers. Some cheered him home, but not as crowds cheer goal. Only a solemn man who brought him fruits thanked him, and then inquired about his soul. Now he will spend a few sick years in institutes, and do what things the rules consider wise, 
and take whatever pity they may dole. Tonight he noticed how the women's eyes passed from him to the strong men that were whole. How cold and late it is. Why don't they come and put him into bed? Why don't they come? End of section. Section 32 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Deadbeat by Wilfred Owen. The Deadbeat. He dropped, more sullenly than wearily, lay stupid like a cod, heavy like meat, and none of us could kick him to his feet. Just blinked at my revolver, blearily. Didn't appear to know a war was on, or see the blasted trench at which he stared. I'll do em in, he whined, if this hand's spared. I'll murder them, I will. A low voice said, It's blighty, perhaps he sees. His pluck's all gone. Dreaming of all the valiant that aren't dead. Bold uncle smiling ministerially. Maybe his brave young wife getting her fun in some new home, improved materially. It's not these stiffs have crazed him, nor the Hun. We sent him down at last, out of the way, unwounded. Stout lad, too, before that strafe. Malingering. Stretcher bearers winked, nor laugh. Next day I heard the doc's well-whiskied laugh. That scum you sent last night soon died. Hooray! End of section. Section 33 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Chances by Wilfred Owen. The Chances. I mind, as at the night afore that show, us five got talking. We was in the know. Over the top tomorrow, boys, we're for it. First wave we are, first ruddy wave. As tore it. Ah well, says Jimmy, and he's seen some scrapping. There ain't more nor five things as can happen. You get knocked out, else wounded, bad or cushy, scuppered or knout, except you're feeling mushy. One of us got the knockout, blown to chops. T'other was hurt like losing both his props. And one, to use the word of hypocrites, had the misfortune to be took by Fritz. Now me, I wasn't scratched, praise God Almighty. Though next time, please, I'll thank him for a blighty. But poor young Jim, he's living and he's not. He reckoned he'd five chances, and he's had. He's wounded, killed, and prisoner. All the lot, the ruddy lot, all rolled in one. Jim's mad. End of section. Section 34 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elan Vital by Sherard Vines I lay in the tepid mud, grey drab, bubbling here and there with steam, a cell rebellious, derisive of my creator's incoherent gropings. I would be the sport no longer of his bovine essays in creation. The other cells, ere they dissolved meekly back into inorganism, tried, at my effrontery, to develop shocked hands that they might hold them up, protesting. I laughed cells laughter, and said, I am life, see me live. I died laughing. I was the creeping things, slime tracking the thundered on primeval strata. In delirious will, I, the crashing behemoth, shouldering through violet nights of fern trees, plucked and ate green sappy fronds, hungry devils made to assimilate weakness, disguised themselves as tendencies and laws, as frost and fire, fulfilling his word. But I was slimmer, 
dodged them, tricked them, fooled them, camouflaged myself from them. And now, Hal, you winters up the draughty sinuous valleys, you storms, burst into tears on the black dripping schist, whine at my windows and doors. I am man, your master, the soul of man, the everlasting sperm and the egg, springing. Sometimes yet you snigger when you think me dead. You think you have me. Sulphur, calcium, gas and earth, debauched by homesickness for the original mud. I fool you. Out of my tunnel, oblivion, like a flashing express, I rush into birth, terribly shrieking with laughter. I am eternal life, though you chased and ate me in the beginning, latterly preached at me moral dogma, I am the resurrection. All your scientific cosmic apparatus cannot dissect me, all your fuss misses my point, for I am a paradox, practical joke of the ancient of days, everything and nothing. End of section Section 35 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Soldier's Last Love, in memory of K. S. H. L. I. by Sherard Vines. Dear, I will not let you sleep. I must be selfish once. I must give you a memory to keep of my dust, sharper than a night of lust, strong as terror, and as deep. I devise this hour and thrust off these bestial pangs of sleep. Take this, my body, before I give it to men's salvation and birds and plants. Be humble and worthy to receive it, as I was humble in esperance, kissing your feet with the kiss of peace in the days of peace, when the gravid moon inscrutably blessed that year's increase, and the dew-wet sickle sang to the hone. Dear, I cannot let you rest. I have grown cruel now. I have smelt the charlock's wind-blown crest on my grave. I, as an obedient slave, wait for death. Grant now, at least, compliance to what I crave. There are so many hours for rest. Not I, mere flesh, but the territory, peopled and parked by my soul, unload, the northern lights of shivering glory, snow-bright peaks like the bones of God, four swift seasons that were my joy, stone-clean limbs in a purple bay, all that I loved when I was a boy, all that I suffered until this day. Sweet distilled from the flaring broom, far from the clachan, where bees would come, salt from seas at the gunwale broken, Music virginal, yet unspoken. Spouting through nights when I tossed awake, Hopeless and aimless for your sake. Ships, like a king's white mistress, preened, Swaggering home to the dove-grey port. Idols to whom I prayed and sinned. Take them, love, for the time is short. Towering thoughts, like hawks of fire, Eager to harry me down the years, prone at the scarlet rusting wire, war long vanished in greed and cheers. I shall not see, I shall not know, impotent, stripped of strength or pain. O oh, love, and this will be long ago, bear with me now, this once again. Dear, I cannot let you see how the night is almost gone, sliding back inexorably. Our communion, limb from limb, and bone from bone, rend, and rest your tired body all today, while I put on death's appalling chastity. End of section. Section 36 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Experience by Sherard Vines Who have the straight direction routine provides, and counts upon each day's mechanic sequence, 
able at barrack square or office table to serve as engines to the rule might pass for strict and strong and dull one seeing such might never guess at aught but patient heedfulness this very lasting monotone which soaks alike in mind and bone adds every day layer upon layer as a long discipline of prayer leads up till sometime unawares the curtain of dimension tears worn thin by the continuous insistence then by each man's use unknown desire against him breaks until his inner temple shakes it may be that some prurient insects from hell's corners are sent and men will marvel how though long in habit temperate and strong one of them in obscene disaster prove some abhorrent thing his master or one who ever sought may hap upon the jewel in heaven's lap and hear the carillions of laughter flung back from heaven's roof and rafter to his tired column on the road the shining silver hands of god will stretch from over some white cloud and he may hear both sweet and loud the singing madness of the lord which with its terrible accord breaks this man's heart and lets his brain rock to the time and ring again though none may see him changed he may look further than the light of day and see those many who not human yet with the forms of man and woman yet like the rocks yet like the trees and the green principalities of meadows and the slashing snow that from the north wind does go are full of sweet and dangerous fire which he may bitterly desire things visible to ribbons torn the world of her known nature shorn and naked the spirits of her crying with a trumpet stir though for less time his seeing last than while a lightning flickers past he knows what he has seen and keeps a double seal upon his lips end of section Section 37 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. New Saints by Sherard Vines. Christ, Communist, accept these latest saints following the antique way. Liebknecht, who scorned kings and the greatest, and Rosa, now grown mystica. His flesh was parted, a new mass, you, living in its mutilation, while in the ditch it came to pass, she had her last and seventh station. The generous roses of her blood now splashed the fields of paradise that soaked and mottled all the road, and he is lovely in God's eyes. Let labourers build a church to show the history of their clean emprise, whom, at your dictates, we will now beatify, then canonise. End of section Section 38 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Über allen Gipfeln ist Ruhe by Sherard Vines. In strangely laminated streaks and layers of terracotta, sulphur, arsenic, crossed by long rays, like steam of amber shaped polygonal, the inexorable sun drops. And the soap magnet, Sir Bonian Bog smokes in his long veranda as the shadow of the great cedar lengthens on the lawn. He watches how all heaven does pulsate and run and melt and crystallise into colour. Perfect, he whispers, perfect, as a tower of vitrine scarlet in fantastic cloud wanes, and he long enjoys its agony. The hands in his soap-boiling factory do not observe the sun. And if they did, they would not be impressed. A factory hand, with soul enough to catch his breath at sunsets, has soul enough to dream of liberty. Wherefore, the sensible Serbonian bog selects employees without any souls. End of section. Section 39 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Dark Church by Sherard Vines Lord Spiritual, in your state of black copes and mitres great, what do you keep your church within? More old than who did not begin, more cunning than the child of sin, the unclean thing beneath the skin. Have you not in your sanctuary the lamp that shows God's heart is merry? We have a dark temple, and do not let the light come rending through. Then say, how many gods have you? We worship two. The first is measured by a span. The second is man and not man. A spring that rises black and thick, and one that was born lunatic. End of section. Section forty of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Materialism, or Pastor Takes the Restaurant Car for Heaven, by Edith Sitwell. Upon sharp floods of noise there glide The red brick houses float, collide With aspidistras, trains on steel That lead us not to what we feel. Hot glassy light fills up the gloom As water an aquarium, all mirror bright. Beneath this scene, our faces coloured by its sheen, Seem objects under water, bent, by each bright-hued advertisement whose words are stamped upon our skin, as though the heat had burnt it in. A vigilting of the train that made all objects coloured bars of shade, projects them sideways till they split, splinters from eyeballs as they flit. Down endless tubes of throats we squeeze our words, Lymphatic paint to please our sense of neatness, Neutralize the over-tint and over-size. I think it true that heaven should be A narrow train for you and me, Where we perpetually must haunt The oblique moving restaurant, And feed on foods of other minds Behind the hot and dusty blinds. End of section Section 41 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Nine Bucolic Poems by Edith Sitwell. 1. What the Goose Girl Said About the Dean. To W. T. Walton. Turn again, turn again, Goose Clotilda, Goosey Jane. Bright wooden waves of people creak from houses built with coloured straws of heat. Dean Pappas long nose snores, harsh as an obois, marshy weak. The wooden waves of people creak through the fields all water sleek, and in among the straws of light those bumpkin obois sounds take flight. Whence he lies snoring like the moon, clownish white all afternoon, beneath the trees are cynical, sharp wood wind tunes, heretical, blown like the wind's mane, creaking woodenly again. His wandering thoughts escape like geese, till he, their goozard, sets up chase, while clouds of wool join the bright race for scattered old simplicities. 2. The Girl with the Lint White Locks To Alvaro Guevara The bright striped wooden fields are edged With foolish cock-crow trees scarce fledged The trees that spin like tops all weathers As strange birds ruffle glassy feathers My hair is white as flocks of geese And water hisses out of this And when the late sun burns my cheek Till it is pink as apples sleek. I wander in the fields and know Why kings do squander pennies so, Lest they at last should weight their eyes. But beggars' ragged minds, more wise, 
no without flesh we cannot see and so they hoard stupidity the dull ancestral memory that is their only property they laugh to see the spring fields edged with noisy cock-crow trees scarce fledged and flowers that grunt to feel their eyes made clear with sight's finalities three by candlelight to sir cheverell the author of bird actors houses red as flower of bean flickering leaves and shadows lean pantaloni like a parrot sat and grumbled in the garret sat and growled and grumbled till moon upon the window sill like a red geranium scented his bald cranium said brigela meaning well pack your box and go to hell heat will cure your rheumatism silence crowned this optimism not a sound and not a wail but the fire lush leafy veil watched the angry feathers fly pantaloni gan to cry could not would not pack his box shadows curtsying hens and cocks pecking in the attic gloom tried to smother his tail plume till a cock's comb candle flame crowing loudly died dawn came four variations on an old nursery rhyme the king of china's daughter so beautiful to see with her face like yellow water left her nutmeg tree her little rope for skipping she kissed and gave it me made of painted notes of singing birds among the fields of tea i skipped across the nutmeg grove i skipped across the sea but neither sun nor moon my dear has yet caught me five serenade bergamasque the tremulous gold of stars within your hair are yellow bees flown from the hive of night finding the blossom of your eyes more fair than all the pale flowers folded from the light then sweet awake and ope your dreaming eyes ere those bright bees have flown and darkness dies six clowns houses beneath the flat and paper sky the sun a demon's eye glowed through the air that mask of glass all wandering sounds that pass seemed out of tune as if the light were fiddle strings pulled tight the market square with spire and bell clanged out the hour in hell the busy chatter of the heat shrilled like a parakeet and shuddering at the noonday light the dust lay dead and white as powder on a mummy's face or fond with simian grace round booths with many a hard bright toy and wooden brittle joy the cap and bells of time the clown that jangling whistled down young cherubs hidden in the guise of every bird that flies and star-bright masks for youth to wear lest any dream that fair bright pilgrim past our ken should see hints of reality upon the sharp-set grass shrill green tall trees like rattles lean and jangle sharp and dizzily but when night falls they sigh till piero moon steals slyly in his face more white than sin black masked and with cool touch lays bare each cherry plum and pear then underneath the veiled eyes of houses darkness lies tall houses 
like a hopeless prayer they cleave the sly dumb air blind are those houses paper thin old shadows hid therein with sly and crazy movements creep like marionettes and weep tall windows show infinity and hard reality the candles weep and pry and dance like lives mocked at by chance the rooms are vast as sleep within when once i ventured in chill silence like a surging sea slowly enveloped me seven miss nettybun and the satyr's child as underneath the trees i pass through emerald shade on hot soft grass petunia faces glowing hued with heat cast shadows hard and crude green velvety as leaves and small fine hairs like grass pierce through them all but these are all asleep asleep as through the schoolroom door i creep in search of you for you evade all the advances i have made come horace you must take my hand this sulking state i will not stand but you shall feed on strawberry jam at tea-time if you cease to slam the doors that open on our sense through which i slipped to drag you hence eight queen venus and the choir boy to naomi royd smith the apples grow like silver trumps that red-cheeked fair-haired angels blow so clear their juice on trees in clumps feathered as any bird they grow a lady stood amid these crops her voice was like a blue or pink glass window full of lollipops her words were very strange i think prince paris too a fair-haired boy plucked me an apple from dark trees since when their smoothness makes my joy if you will pluck me one of these i'll kiss you like a golden wind as clear as any apples be and now she haunts my singing mind and oh she will not set me free nine tourne tourne bon chevaux de bois turn turn again apes blood in each vein the people that pass seem castles of glass the old and the good giraffes of blue wood the soldier the nurse wooden face and a curse are shadowed with plumage like birds by the gloomage blond hair like a clown's the music floats drowns the creaking of ropes the breaking of hopes the wheezing the old like harmoniums scold go to babylon rome the brain cells called home the grave new jerusalem wrinkled methuselah from half floating hair derived the first fair and queer inspiration of music the nation of bright plumed trees and harpy shrill breeze turn turn again apes blood in each vein end of section Section 42 of Wheels, The Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Press Notices The Athenaeum We are all relieved from a certain tension as at the accession of Charles II. The Athenaeum, in a full-page review entitled The Post-Georgians. Wheels, Qua Anthology, has assuredly made an impression from the start. It indicated that an hour had struck, a mote had passed, that a new fashion had arrived. So the daffodil and the rainbow and the cuckoo were to be put away, and the harlequinades of the harlotry players and the columbines of Verlaine and Simons 
to be had out again. We are all relieved from a certain tension, as at the accession of Charles the Second. Wheels marked the change in fashion. Vers libre and cubism already existed, but Wheels at least acknowledged the fact. It showed a willingness to experiment, a tolerance of various emotions, and a complete indifference to simplicity. This last item is most important, for the last literary mode had been wholly corrupted by simplicity. Great simplicity is only won by an intense moment, or by years of intelligent effort, or by both. It represents one of the most arduous conquests of the human spirit, the triumph of feeling and thought over the natural sin of language. Simplicity is merely a means, a means of direct contact. It is a virtue of expression. Simplicity was not hard won by the Georgians, it was given them by the fairy, and so, securely simple in their hearts, they neglected the more pharisaical virtue of simplicity in expression. Wheels, by contrast, has stood on the side of intelligence. It recognised that there are some pretty complicated feelings in life which are worth a little pains to express. Mr. Huxley is one of the few younger poets who have written a few interesting poems which express very well feelings characteristic of adolescence. Mr. Osbert Sitwell's Youth and Age and This Generation are much better stuff than that of the war poets. In Mr. Sacheverell Sitwell's best poems, there has always been an insight, a unit of vision. He is capable of something exceptional, to be won by infinite labour. Miss Edith Sitwell's coloured furniture is so cleverly done, at times, that we wonder whether she is not fully justified in doing nothing else. Songerie is much better done than Goblin Market. Miss Sitwell can be depended upon, in work like this, never to be ridiculous. She is unusual among contemporaries in that she cannot fall into vulgarity or cheapness. The Saturday Review In a Leading Article The Sitwell family, Mr Huxley, Miss Tree and Mr Vines are very tiresome young people, but they share this quality with Shelley and the young Swinburne. They excite annoyance, and a very good thing too. It is a business of genius, particularly of genius not yet arrived, to worry the middle sort. Genius, let it be remembered, just outruns Bolshevism. It is as scornful of the new sham as of the old, and in our view, Miss Sitwell's Songerie, and Mr Huxley with his ventre à terre, head in air, your centaurs are your only poets, their hoofs strike sparks from the flints, and they see both very near and immensely far. Get there before Lenin. They have found the new thing first, and they are making the new world before the red hand has had a chance to break the old one. Miss Tree is venomously alive, and Mr Vines touches something like the truth. Edith Sitwell is a person of genius. The Sitwell brothers can do Beaumont and Fletcher to the life after death, and change them to modern wonder. The Nation it behoves the writers of Wheels to remember that nine days do not last for ever, and that we now look for something more than brilliance, talent, waywardness, light brigade charges against poetic conventions and skittles from them. Miss Edith Sitwell's passionate, sombre spirit can use any formula it chooses, any idiom or wording, from gaudy melon flowers to ginger beer bottles, without wasting its breath. The Saturday Westminster Gazette. They are beginning to show collective individuality. Miss Edith Sitwell has come to possess a real style. She has invented a rushing couplet in which she crams the giddy sun's kaleidoscope. Her verses read like a parable of something seen by Beardsley and coloured by Gauguin. The Times Literary Supplement. This opens in the second poem called Clavichords by Osbert Sitwell, with a composition in free metre of such true and delicate beauty that one follows it up greedily for further discoveries, but without much satisfaction. Arnold James has ideas which he can hammer out into striking expression. From the Sunday Times Mr Norman Rowe, 
in his book entitled Sonnets of Old Things, is literary. Every one of his charming poems can be read with pleasure. Here is an example of Mr. Rowe's honest sentiment. I have a little landmark where a baby trod, a full six inches up the stair. Do you think that God was there to watch my baby when she trod the bottom stair? We think it quite likely. The same honesty of sentiment cannot very well be credited to the neurotic young men and women who have been responsible for wheels. I'm not out to provide Miss Sitwell with a tiara on the cheap. From A or The Common Cause The title Wheels does suggest progress, and for this reason it is appropriate, not because young poets and poetasters of both sexes do necessarily make progression in their work, but because the lively reader perpetually hopes that they have done so. Edith Sitwell remains stationary. It is as though she had polished and chipped and varnished all depth and subtlety away. Her obscurity is not in the least suggestive. Open letter from the editor of Wheels to Miss Jones of A or The Common Cause. Dear Miss Jones, if you will pardon the expression, although the above is unsigned, I detect in it the traces, less of the cloven hoof, than of a certain wooden head. I can quite understand your taking a rooted dislike to skilled technique in poetry, but may I suggest that the loss of subtlety is not always, as is the case with my poems, the result of polish. I will quote you an instance to prove the reverse of your argument, placing together Albert Samin's polished and technically perfect poem, L'Indifferent, and your translation of the same. L'Indifferent by Albert Samin dont le parc vaporeux eut leur cénémore, le robe de ses teint et les sveltes menteurs, le melon reflété au ciel comme des oeufs, et sur la fin d'un soir infini qu'on se bourre, l'indifférent au la lignée ou de la cile, sur la scène d'un geste adorable et grécile, du bout de ses doigts vincème un peu de son cœur. Translation by Miss Jones. Down in the park, grown vaporous and wide, the long cloaks and the satin dresses make mingled reflections in the unruffled lake, and nostrils breathe the infinite eventide. The indifferent one, weary of gentle friends, scatters abroad from delicate finger ends, and gracefully, a little of his heart. I like you personally, Miss Jones, so I prefer to draw a veil over the rest of this painful scene, in which the magic of your touch has converted from a fête galante into a family party at Lyons Popular. Frankly, darling, what a stinker! Don't do it ever again, please, Miss Jones. Poor tasters, indeed. Believe me, in spite of this little rift in the lute, yours faithfully, the editor of Wheels. The Pioneer Mr. Aldous Huxley's style is individual, at times attaining great heights. Mr. Osbert Sitwell's sylvan Song of the Fawns might almost have been taken from a Jacobean mask, and there are passages that haunt one in the old way of fine poetry. Mr. Arnold James' two poems, The Poet's Task and Now from Light of the Sun, My Eyes Are Hidden, are especially noteworthy and of a singular beauty. They have the manner of great poetry, the old lure of exquisite cadences, the fine phrase, the fine thought, the sincerity and simplicity essential to good art. The greatest step forward, however, is taken by Mr. Sherard Vines. His real power and extraordinary command of language and rhythm are nobly used in the splendid and militant sunrise. This, and the equally fine poem, The Prophet, have a speed and tempestuous quality almost Swinburnian. End of section. Section 43 of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bibliography. Wheels, first volume, 1916. Published by B. H. Blackwell. 
conceived in morbid eccentricity and executed in fierce factitious gloom. Paul Moore Gazette We have no doubt whatever that, fifty years hence, the publication of Wheels will be remembered as a notable event in the inner history of English literature. Morning Post Aldous Huxley, The Burning Wheel, published by B. H. Blackwell Without any doubt, an original poet. The Nation Edith Sitwell, The Mother and Other Poems, published by B. H. Blackwell In all these poems, one thing is clear. They come from within. Miss Sitwell does not describe, she lives in her verse. This very little, therefore, points a long way. The Times Edith and Osbert Sitwell, 20th Century Harlequinade Published by B. H. Blackwell Every pretty woman carries a vanity bag into which she puts all her most cherished possessions, from a passionate letter from Flanders to a dinky little pink stick of lip salve. When writers of verses are happy enough to collar publishers, they put all the most precious possessions of their hearts into their books, which are vanity bags. This vanity bag is not so pretty. The New Witness Osbert Sitwell's Tremendous Babel The Morning Post E. Wyndham Tennant Warple Flit and Other Poems Published by B. H. Blackwell Mr. Tennant has an unclouded vision and the blessed gift of direct speech. The Glasgow Herald Iris Tree Poems Privately Printed Sherard Vines The Two Worlds Published by B. H. Blackwell An extremely vivid and charming poet. The Nation Sir Cheverell Sitwell The People's Palace This is the most advanced poetry we have had so far. Advanced in that it is founded on a theory probably new to this country. Robert Nichols in The New Witness We have attributed more to Mr. Sitwell than to any poet of quite his generation. We require of him only ten years of toil. T.S. Eliot in The Egoist The Mayor of Mercia is almost unreadable for dullness. Jones, Miss Topsy in A or The Common Cause The word dire shows real observation and imagination. It illuminates. It is the word one might have thought of and didn't. Jones, Miss in A or The Common Cause Editor's Note Hoity-toity, Topsy Jones Our Stylists The People's Palace purports to be a collection of verse by Sir Cheverell Sitwell. Its sheer inanity is beyond description. The audacity of wasting precious paper, to say nothing of printing ink, on such unadulterated drivel, take, sick, one's breath away. The World Editor's Note A society paper, I believe. Exhibits all the characteristic traits of Mr. Sitwell's rhyming. To wit, a rather tortuous and alembicated diction, profusely interspersed with an intricate preciosity of imagery, and far-fetched ideas clothed in elaborate language. The Aberdeen Daily Journal. Aldous Huxley, The Defeat of Youth, published by B. H. Blackwell. The best thing in Mr. Huxley's new volume is The Defeat of Youth. The later poems in the book belong to his subjective eccentric period, wherein lies are notable epigrammatists. Love songs are hardly in Mr. Huxley's line, and when they do occur, it sounds like the love gambles of the blob. The Nation Mr. Huxley is a poet whom it is as difficult to praise outright as it is to overlook him altogether. Exceedingly good translation of La Prédie Midi d'un Faune. Almost all the reviewers like this translation. If Mr. Huxley could abandon his search for the rarer emotions for rareness sake, and if he could be a little less ingenious, all round he would be a better poet. Land and Water Mr. Huxley's great merit is that he does not attempt to conceal his sophistication. His great defect 
is that the degree of his sophistication is rather overwhelming. His verse is truly elegant, its rhythms are good, it is incisely phrased, it is devoid of clichés, it is often ironically witty, and often originally and agreeably coloured. He is too self-conscious, too vividly aware that nearly everything has been done already. It would be possible to demonstrate his power to write beautifully and well from almost any page in his volume. The New Statesman Scholarly and Acceptable Verse The Literary World Mr. Huxley is a poet who focuses his mind without stint into verse, a process which has its dangers, but his mind is so richly stored and so quickly receptive that the result never lacks interest. It is clear that any idea or emotion that comes to him has the best possible chance of surviving beautifully. The Times Wit is the delightfully firm ground beneath all Mr. Huxley's poems. We feel that he knows where he is going, even when he goes with as little grace as a poodle on its hind legs in pursuit of a biscuit. The poems in which he seems to us to achieve keen beauty are The Elms, Inspiration, and Out of the Window, The Athenaeum. Admiral qualities of rhythm, diction, imagery, and frequently wit, but the emotions of which these are the vehicles are frequently very tenuous and more subtle than profound. The Westminster Gazette. His response and reaction to the appeal of loneliness, the significance of small contacts and idle feelings, the implications of daily life, are sure and instant. The Common Cause. Edith Sitwell, Clowns' Houses, published by B. H. Blackwell. Miss Sitwell's verses may remind some people of the Italian comedy seen through a distorting mirror. The Italian comedy is a little formula that will contain a very large bulk of life, and Miss Sitwell's performing matter has mind behind it. We convolute and spiralise, but somebody has hold of the strings. Her method has, to a certain extent, been a cockshy for the trumpery reviewer, but inasmuch as she does not use it either perversely or to exploit her personality, we rather admire her courage than deprecate the chosen vessel of its wrath. The Nation If by chance, which is not so improbable as appears, Miss Sitwell's teapot reminded her first of the Tower of London and then of Joan of Arc, she would say so without hesitation or consistency. For the most part, we believe that she is trying her best to be honest with her own conceptions, and that being so, she is, of course, perfectly right not to care whether they appear outlandish. The Times Literary Supplement She is a poet for whose poetry the taste must emphatically be acquired. What seemed like imaginative madness shows, on closer acquaintance, much method. The Oxford Chronicle Miss Sitwell can write fête galante and perverted nursery rhymes as well as any poet alive. New Statesman Fire is Miss Sitwell's element. Every man. Miss Sitwell is best and most herself when she dances a gracefully grotesque pas seul of absurdities, using rhyme, as Monsieur Duhamel puts it, pour taper du ton long le pas d'une petite danse qui en accaborde, and pour naître des talons rouges dans une fête galante. The Saturday Westminster Gazette. Miss Sitwell is in danger of being, as they say in the nursery, too clever by half. Her particular gift is for the making of a kind of nonsense rhyme that is as gay and pretty and inconsequent as the lights of a fair. The world, as she describes it, indeed, is more like a flower show in a gale or a circus when the tent pole breaks, a big haphazard pitching and tossing of marquees than part of a mathematically punctual universe. The Athenaeum Her whole book has in it a nightmare quality of ugliness. We wonder what is Miss Sitwell's conception of the true function of poetry. Cambridge Review Note The editor of Wheels is always pleased to answer any question as courteously put 
as the above. Miss Sitwell's conception of the true function of poetry is the same. Little Arthur has her conception of the true function of space, eternity, the will to be, the daily mail, or any other eternal verity. End of section. End of Wheels, the Fourth Cycle. Recording by Eva Davis, Nemo, Ian King, Newgate Novelist, and Algie Pug.